Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to Crossroads tonight. I'm so glad that you're with us this last service of the day. You're welcome to take out your message notes that are right there in your program. Um, as mentioned, you could also follow along on the church app. Um, we're continuing this message series uh, titled Solutions in the Sea. And interestingly enough, as you study the Bible, uh, what you find is, is that there are a number of incredible stories that take place, whether by the sea or literally sometimes on the sea, and they become the backdrop for incredible miracles concerning uh, really the, the incredible and unmatched power of Almighty God. And so uh, this evening is no different. Um, I want to talk with you specifically about the solution of provision. See, God has uh, made all of us aware throughout the Scriptures that He's a God who's faithful to provide. And uh, really, my ability and your ability, um, not just to know that intellectually or academically, but to believe that with all our heart, that God takes special care and interest in providing for His children, will prove to be a sustaining force in your relationship with God and your life for that matter. And so once again, the sea bears witness uh, to God's handiwork. You know, we've given you a lot of facts already, really about just the astounding, um, incredible nature of the sea, God's creation of the ocean. We've talked about the size of it, the depths of it. Um, another fact tonight that really ties into the message is um, that it's, it's pretty incredible to know that uh, God has, uh, and they've estimated that there are 3.5 trillion fish in the ocean in the bodies of water. Pretty remarkable. I'm not sure how you guesstimate that. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. Um, uh, but we know maybe one of them's named Nemo, but, uh, but you talk, that's a lot of fish. Anywhere from 18,000 to 30,000 different species that they know of. And so it's just pretty amazing when you consider the vastness of the ocean um, and God's creation. And once again, it provides um, really a scene for some incredible miracles in the Bible. And we're going to look at one of them tonight that has to do with the sea and the fish. And so I want to invite you to turn with me to the 17th chapter of Matthew's gospel. And as you find your place there, we'll be starting in verse 24, going to verse 27. And this, of course, um, involves Jesus and Peter um, and, and a fish. I'm not sure what the fish's name was, but this fish is going to have something pretty interesting in his mouth. And it provides for you and I, again, an incredible reminder that God is faithful, listen, to provide. And so as we come to verse 24, we'll break these things down. And uh, whether you are in a season right now of it could be need right now in your own life, um, it, it could be you're, you, maybe you're on top of the mountain right now, okay, and, and you're just praising God. Wherever you are in that journey, either in the valley or on top of the mountain or somewhere in between, it's important never to lose sight of the fact that God is faithful to provide. And this is so important that Jesus is going to provide this lesson for one of his top men, Peter, because if Peter's going to be the man of faith and the leader uh, that God has willed for him to be, Peter has to step into this understanding that he's a God who provides, because certainly there are going to be some bigger roads ahead, um, some darker times ahead for Peter, and he's going to have to have his conviction solidified, as is the case for you and I. We're going to go through things in our life, and we don't need a cookie-cutter version of Christianity. We don't need to have our ears tickled. Uh, we need to develop a conviction of who God is and truly what God is capable of doing in my life and your life. In this story, just like it was for Peter, 2,000 years plus later, could do the same for you and for me. And so without any further ado, let's jump in here at verse 24. This is what we read. It says, when they, that being the disciples and Jesus, came to Capernaum, those who collected were told the temple tax. They approached Peter, and this is what they said. It's a question to Peter. Doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax. Now, before we go any further, uh, this opening verse really sets the stage for not only the miracle, uh, but really some of these insights and principles that Jesus wants us to see in between. But we're told that when they came to Capernaum, we know that uh, several disciples called Capernaum home. Um, Jesus had some home roots there as well. Peter specifically lived there. Now, by profession, prior to following Christ, what was Peter? He was a what? A shoe salesman? No, he was a what? 
He's a fisherman. And so keep that in mind, because that's important for the story, especially the back end. But Peter did well for himself. There's this misconception that anybody who followed Jesus, they had nothing else going for them. So Jesus was kind of like the next best thing. So let me just go, I'm, I'm some bum on the side of the road. And Jesus picks me up. Well, certainly Jesus cared for those who uh, may have been uh, struggling uh, in their own means or lacked affluence. Uh, but that wasn't Peter. Peter had fishing business. He wasn't just a fishing laborer. He had boats, plural, nets, plural. That means he had a crew. Peter did well for himself. And he basically left all of that to follow Christ, we know, as we're told in Luke chapter 5. Nevertheless, uh, a few years later now, approaching really the cross, a shadow of the cross is in view here, they come back to Capernaum, which is Peter's hometown. And I believe the setting is Peter's house. I believe they're outside Peter's house. And it says that they're approached um, about a temple tax. Now, we live in New York. We know all about taxes a little too much. And even their secret taxes like cameras and tolls, those are taxes too when you add it up if you think about it, okay? But uh, normally when you read the Gospels and you hear about taxes, our thoughts um, go to the Romans because the Romans collected taxes from the Jews. And the Jews didn't like that uh, because they occupied where the Jews were. They especially didn't like it if you were a Jew like Matthew who went to work for Rome and collected taxes from your fellow people. You aren't getting too many invitations to go swimming if that was you, okay? But that's not this type of tax. This is a tax that every Jew was told to pay after the age of 20, and it's one that they did really out of um, not just obligation, uh, but out of responsibility, out of accountability, if you will. Because this temple tax went to the care of the temple. Much like you and I might say in our modern day vernacular, well, we got to keep the lights on, you know? Can't just call Con Edison up or whoever owns the electric and go, hey, uh, we're going to pray for you if you could just keep the lights on and not collect the bill. And so there was, there was an upkeep that was involved. Um, there were needs, maintenance needs that were involved with the temple. And so those Jews gladly gave knowing that it was the upkeep of the temple. And um, we find out as we study this that what they exactly gave was something called two dramaticas, and that was a that was coinage in their day. It was a it was a, a Greek coin, um, the equivalency of maybe sixty five cents um, in in our maybe currency. But they gave that really willingly, and so they approached Peter. Now, why Peter? Because Peter's kind of like the spokesman. You know, Peter was a business owner. Peter has leadership capabilities, and he is seen as quote unquote the captain, if you will of the apostles, the, the first Avengers here, okay? He's seen as the captain here. And so they come to him and they say, doesn't your teacher pay a temple tax? Now, I believe that um, it's biblical here. We see this to pay the tax. Exodus 30 shows us that for the temple. But I don't think they're interested in fulfilling what Moses wrote about in the Pentateuch. I think they're trying to entrap Jesus because haven't they done that a number of times? That seems to be one of their plays in their book, you know? We're gonna try to get Jesus to speak against what God has already said, and that will essentially delegitimize him from these audacious claims to be the Messiah. And so I think that's definitely in play here. Um, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Now, what's gonna be Peter's response? He's put on the spot here, and this is what he says in verse 25. Take notice, he says, yes. And then when he went into the house, so he, he gives the answer, okay? You got, you got the temple press corps out there. Peter gives the answer, yes. Now Peter goes back into the house and then Jesus spoke with them first. Now Jesus wasn't out there for the conversation. The fact that Jesus knows about this conversation is once again evidence of his omniscience. He knows this conversation is taking place, even though he's not there. It's not like he's watching on the ring doorbell and he's listening in or something like that. But Jesus has knowledge of this. And so now Peter comes in and Jesus is going to ask him a question. Now notice the first question. He says to Peter, what do you think? Can you say that with me? What do you think? Contrary to misconception, God wants you to use your mind. We're not to be these religious robots that just regurgitate, you know, spiritual facts with no thought involved. God wants you to use your mind. He's created your mind because he knows that if you could get the scripture in your mind, it will yield an unmistakable, incorruptible peace that you cannot manufacture elsewhere. 
And so enter this situation here and this question, Peter, what do you think? And I believe he's asking Peter that question for two reasons. First of all, for Peter's benefit. Because if Peter's going to step into the plans that God has, Peter has to think a certain way. Peter has to have a perspective and a mindset that believes in God exclusively for provision. Because God's going to do some miracles through Peter we're going to see later on. We have the rest of the story. Peter doesn't. But in order for Peter to get there, he's got to go to another level in his thinking. He can't have this mindset that, you know what, a little bit of God, a little bit of me, and it happens. No. Or it's all by my strength. No. Peter has to come to a place where he knows without a shadow of a doubt that God is able and God is faithful to provide. And I think that's why Jesus poses this question to Peter for him, first of all, that Peter's got to think that way. But I also think it's been preserved in the Holy Scriptures so we can have that question as well. What do we think? What do we think concerning provision? Now, as this continues here, what do you think? And now he's going to ask him another question. Again, this is concerning the tax, okay? From whom do earthly kings collect tariffs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? It's a very good question. History tells us that kings of any land, their family as well as themselves, the crown essentially exempts you from having to pay taxes. And so who pays the tax, Peter? The sons or the strangers? Certainly the son doesn't pay the tax if his father is the king. So now Peter then says, from the strangers. Then the sons are free, Jesus told them. What is Jesus connecting here? He's saying, Peter, they're asking you if I pay a tax. Well, socially, Jesus was considered like a rabbi. So rabbis were supposedly exempt from the tax. But even greater than that, Jesus is the rightful king of kings and Lord of lords. And what he's telling Peter is, Peter, if you're connected to me, you're connected to the father and the sons are free. The sons will be provided for, not because of who they are, but whose they are. Big difference. He's getting Peter to a place where Peter's going to think like a child of God. So take notice of that principle right here in your notes. And that's something we always want to keep before us. If we're going to have this understanding that God is a God who provides, take notice of this principle. Think like a child of God. It's foundational. Let's say it together. Think like a child of God. You know, the next time you find yourself getting consumed with worry and doubt, let me just tell you, that's not of God. You know what you need to say? I got to think like a child of God. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. But God is faithful. These are things that we need to remind ourselves of. Maybe Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. These are things that we need to kind of review because when, there, when, when a need arises, sometimes it could be a medical need could be something that you got at the doctor's office, terrible news. It could be maybe something that came in the mail. You know, the IRS, they hired all those agents to send you more, more love mail, okay, love notes, okay, about what you owe them, really. And, and so it could be something like that. It could be relational. You just need emotional. We all go through trouble, troubles between our ears, okay? Um, and so it, whatever it might be, I got to remember, I'm a child of God, and God is faithful to provide. The same way he takes care of the birds, He'll take care of me. And Jesus said that earlier in Matthew's gospel. Look what it says here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. Jesus said, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Finish the rest of it with me. Are you not much more valuable than they? That's a rhetorical question, by the way. Of course you and I are. And God is faithful to provide. Now, before we move on to the next uh, section of Scripture and points, um, I heard this story about a king's family, and his oldest son kind of got jammed up. He was doing the wrong thing, and so he left for shame, similar to kind of the prodigal son in some ways, where he kind of took whatever he had and he wasted it, so now he has nothing. And so he finds himself in dire straits. Well, guess what happens? Some of the king's men find him on the street, At first, they didn't recognize him, but then they put one and one together that this is the king's son. Now, the king missed his son. So they said to the the son, they go, where have you been? And he said, well, I've been doing this, I've been doing that. He said, well, you got to come back home to the palace. He said, I can't go back there. My father wants nothing to do with me. 
And the king's man said, on the contrary, every night he sets a dinner place setting for you at the royal table, waiting for you to come back. That's his hope and that's his prayer. And with that, the young man got up and the men took him back. They got him cleaned up and he went and was reunited with his father. You know, that's how God sees you and I. Sometimes we think, well, Ray, I believe all this provision stuff, but you don't know what I've done. Well, God does. And God has big shoulders. It's his prerogative if he chooses to love you unconditionally. We don't love, just because we don't love that way, we say we do, doesn't mean God doesn't. And so when you begin to look at this story here, this is next level thinking. This is high level thinking here. This is how God wants us to be. And he wants us to think like a child of God. He doesn't want us to have thoughts that are, that are kind of relegated to this world. And you have to understand something. The world is hostile towards you and I thinking this way. And in case um, we need any reminding of that, look what took place this weekend at the Olympics. Now, there are those who are trying to spin it a different way, and that's not what it meant, and it was about a goddess. Whether, whether the intention was there or not, it looks too close, okay? And it's so much so that now the Olympic Committee has come out and they've, they, they've apologized for it. You have members of the parliament. You have scores of people. This tickled people the wrong way. But let me tell you something. If people want to go defend it, you know, where, you know what's even worse? Is that people are rushing to defend it, and they should be rushing to the defense of the child that was in the performance and the many children who saw the performance. Why are you okay with that? But you got to get on your high horse and try to educate everybody. That speaks of a deeper issue, my friends. And see, as a father, as, as a coach, as a pastor, it doesn't sit well with me to see drag queen stuff be pushed down the throats of children, let alone be in a performance. Last year, the city of New York used our taxpayer money, $220,000, to pay for drag queen performances that went into the schools, even special needs classrooms. How terrible is that? We should have a voice on what's being taught in the classrooms. We don't have to be, now we could do it respectfully. We're not looking to break any heads or anything like that, but we need to, we need to respectfully, listen, there's nothing wrong, it's thinking like a child of God. You know, if I'm gonna think like a child of God, well then I need to be in agreement with God. I can't be concerned all the time, well, what if this and what if this person thinks that? What does God think? I need to think like God. And that will always yield blessing in your life. You'll never be at a point in your life where you go, man, I'm real, man, this thinking like God stuff, it really messed me up. You'll never have that. The opposite is true. You will be going, man, I should have been thinking like this a long time ago. I need to think about, I need to, I need to think like a child of God if I'm in the boardroom, the classroom, the ball field. I just I need to think as God wants me to think. And that's gonna yield peace and provision. The opposite yields confusion, delusion. Some of it's demonic. And so I, I got to have this solution of provision, but I got to think like a child of God first. It's kind of backwards to say, I'm going to think like a child of God, but God, uh, you have your opinions of things, I'll have mine. doesn't work that way. For your faith to be unleashed for great things, I got to think like a child of God. And that's what he's teaching Peter here, Peter with the you thing. And Peter answers the question correctly. There's another part here to this that you don't want to miss, though, because now we're thinking, okay, Jesus is going to say, forget about the tax. Well, he doesn't say that. Look what next, the next verse is in verse 27. But so we don't offend them. What? Let's offend them, right? No, Jesus don't want to offend anybody. Now, you don't want to offend anybody in this way because the temple's important, and he recognizes that. So we don't offend them. I want you to go to the sea. There's our backdrop again. Most likely the Sea of Galilee. Go to the sea and cast in a fish hook and take the first fish that you catch. Now we'll get to the catch in just a moment on the back end. But we don't offend anybody. Well, what is Jesus saying here? He's saying, Peter, we got bigger, well, no pun intended, bigger fish to fry, okay? We got bigger things to do, Peter. We're not gonna get caught up in a squabble about two dramaticas, okay? Uh, we're not gonna get caught up in that. We got bigger things we're doing. We're going to major in the majors. We'll keep the main thing, the main thing. This doesn't cost us our convictions. Uh, this doesn't put us at odds with God. Uh, there's no, we, could, we could do this. This is not going to in any way compromise 
what we're and our mission's about. And we don't want to stir up anything because there's something greater that's going to happen in a short time from now called the cross. So we don't want to get them distracted. We don't want to get them caught up in that. So we're going to go along with this. We're going to do this. And I'm going to show you how we're going to pay for this. But we don't want to offend them. What is Jesus doing here? I think this is important when it comes to miracles and seeing God do great things. Take notice of this principle, and it goes as follows. Take the high road. Now, you've heard me say for years, take the high road. There's less traffic there, by the way. Everybody's on the low road. He could have got into a squabble. He could have condemned them and said, listen, all you try to do is use the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible to entrap me. I know you, I, I'm calling your numbers. I see what you're doing. He doesn't do that. Instead, he knows that there's something greater that's coming. So he takes the high road. And if you're going to have God bless you, you can't go down in the mud with people. You can't treat people in a bad way. It's kind of, again, a contradiction of a prayer to be praising God on Sunday and act like a louse the rest of the week. What kind of message does that send to heaven? See, could God trust you? A story that comes to mind about then and blessing is Joseph. Remember Joseph from the Old Testament? We know the story well, and even if you don't, I know it sounds like a, a daytime soap opera or you know some type of movie, but, but they should make a movie about it, but it's an incredible story. But Joseph, um, really, he was the victim of some jealousy from his brothers. So much so that they threw him a beat and dumped him in a well, and then they came up with this idea to sell him into slavery, fabricate a lie that an animal killed him. They even took his coat that his father gave him, dipped it in animal's blood, and said, look, Dad, Joseph's done. And so after that, Joseph was falsely accused, thrown into prison. Now time, a significant amount of time goes by, and while all this is ensuing, Joseph has a gift, as we know, the gift to interpret dreams. Pharaoh gets wind of that. Now, all throughout his story, there's an incredible phrase that says, and the Lord was with Joseph. Don't forget that. The Lord was with Joseph. And he gets summons out of the prison. He helps Pharaoh out. And over a series of time, he gets elevated to the equivalency of the prime minister of Egypt. And those same brothers that did him dirty, that did him wrong, a famine hits the land, not a coincidence. And God brings these brothers to his doorstep. They don't recognize him because now he's got a new do. In fact, he's got no do. He's got his whole head shaved off like the Egyptians do, maybe some more paint, a new outfit, okay? They haven't seen him in a while. They have that Hebrew look, okay? But they, and then when everybody recognizes each other, they actually say, he's going to kill us. And he has the power to. With what, Listen, with one word, they could be done. And you know what Joseph says to them? I'm fast-forwarding the story. Um, but Joseph says to them, you know what you meant for evil? God has meant for good for such a time as this to save many. You know what that's called? That's called thinking like a child of God, and that's called taking the high road. And that's how God wants you and I to be. He wants us to be people who take the high road. Now, before we move on to our last uh, verse and um, the last principle here, um, I'm reminded of um, a poem that Mother Teresa wrote, and it was then um, adapted into a book. It really was kind of like a leadership book. Um, a life leadership book, but it's called The Paradoxical Commandments uh, by Kevin Keith. And it goes like this, again, borrowing from the great Mother Teresa. This is what it says. It says, people are illogical, unreasonable, and self-centered. Love them anyway. If you do good, people will accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Do good anyway. If you are successful, you will win false friends and true enemies. Succeed anyway. The good you do today We'll be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Honesty and frankness make you vulnerable. Be honest and frank anyway. The biggest men and women with the biggest ideas can be shot down by the smallest men and women with the smallest minds. Think big anyway. People favor underdogs, but only follow the top dogs. Fight for a few underdogs anyway. What you spend years building may be destroyed overnight. Build anyway. People really need help, but may attack you if you do help them. Help people anyway. Give the world your best, but you might get kicked in the teeth. Give the world your best anyway. It's a reminder to take the high road. That's what God has called us to do. One of the best ways we represent Christ in this hostile, sinful world is that we have this attitude and these actions 
that resemble our Savior. Remember what Jesus said in, when he endured the sufferings of the cross and all that entailed, the beatings? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God has called us to think this way, and this is, again, something that is congruent in Scripture. Look what it says in Romans chapter 12. Now, as you get ready to read this verse, verse 18, this verse uh, means a lot to me because uh, when I was about 16 or 17 years of age, somebody had done something, and I wanted to get even with them, and I was thinking about doing some nice things. I just want to tell you that I probably wouldn't be here. I probably have a prison ministry maybe, okay? I'd be there, um, okay? It's the night service, I could say it. I wanted to whack somebody, okay? Uh, but God had other plans, okay? Look what it says here in verse 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, get revenge. No, it doesn't say that, okay? Let's say it together. Live peaceably with all people. I just feel at peace just saying that. Live peaceably with all people. I can't do that, God. Yeah, you know, I kind of wish this wasn't in the Bible sometimes, right? But it is. He's called us to take the high road. Now, your flesh wants to take the low road. My flesh wants to get, my flesh wants to get mail on the low road. I don't know about you. But God says, I got greater things for you. And I think this is connected to provision because how could God trust Joseph if Joseph would have used this position to get even with his brothers? We know we could trust God, but here's the question that we've asked before. Could God trust you? Could he trust you with incredible provision, leadership, uh, position, prestige, you name it? Can God trust you? If you want to answer yes to that question, say, God, I know it's going to be hard sometimes, but I'm going to take the high road. Now, as much as it depends on you, sometimes you got to defend yourself. Nothing wrong with that. Maybe you got to defend the honor of a woman who's being attacked by somebody or a kid, okay? All right, uh, you know, nothing wrong with that. We should do that. God's not passive, okay? Just go study the Old Testament, okay? Study David, okay? There's nothing wrong with, with that, but peace through strength. And so we want to have this strength in the Lord, and that will promote peace. We can't be weak in these areas. Um, and so take the high road. This is something he's instilling. Peter, we're going to get caught up offending them. This is what you're going to do, Peter. Now, that sets really the rest of the story up. Just going back to the top of this verse, so we don't offend them, go to the sea. Go where? Go to the bank? No. Go to Quicken Loans? No. Go to where? To the sea. That's where the provision is. And cast in a fish hook and take the first fish that you catch. Now, when you open its mouth, you're going to find a coin. Little Nemo is going to have a coin in his mouth. Take it and give it to them. Now, before we finish the rest of it, what is Peter by profession? We mentioned it at the top once again. Peter was what? Fisherman. Why is Jesus telling a fisherman how to fish? And he's telling him to go catch a fish, and that's going to take care of this need. What was he doing? I think he's teaching incredible lessons here for Peter and for you and I. First, he's telling Peter, go cast a hook. Now, I'm thinking Peter might be saying, you know what? A net will work a lot better. Now, how many of you like to fish? Anybody like to fish? Okay, I know you do. Okay, now let me tell you something. I brought my tackle box from home, okay? I got some things in here. And I got a, a nice little cute fish hooky that I, I want to show you, okay? Somebody was, somebody was in my box looking. I thought they were going to steal it after the last service, okay? But it's not, thou shall not steal, okay? All right. But uh, here's a little fish hooky here, okay? I got other hooks in here, a little worm. This is fake. Don't worry about it, okay? All right, front row, don't worry about that. But I'm sure, now Peter didn't have a tackle box, but I'm sure Peter was going through his mental tackle box. And he's thinking, wait a minute, the carpenter's telling the fisherman how to fish. But then I think he's thinking, well, when he called me, he did tell me when to throw the nets down, the opposite time of the day, which we're going to study that story, by the way, in this series. And we caught so many fish, the nets were breaking and the boats were sinking. So I think I'm going to listen to him because he kind of knows about the sea. And so, but Jesus is giving him this lesson, even though Peter's testimony begins with an amazing catch. Why is that? Because this is a lesson that we need to keep learning, that we need to be obedient. Don't trust what we think is right. Trust what God says. And so here's the principle in your notes. Trust thy ways over my ways. Now let's say it with the actual hand gestures, okay? Thy is a fancier way for saying your, by the way. Thy, remember, we memorized the Lord's Prayer. Some of you, okay, if you had a lot of penance like me, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Okay, so remember that. So let's say it together. Trust 
thy ways over my ways. And God has already said, my ways are not your, my ways are higher than your ways. Your ways are going to tell you to do it your way. And he could have easily told Peter, go find this or, you know, uh, go, go ask Judas for the money. I know Judas was dipping into the, to the purse. John tells us that, but there's, he didn't tell him to go there. He told him to go where Peter felt strong to show him that God's greater, that God is the source. See, see, some of you might have direct deposit. You might get paid every two weeks, once a month. You might have a home, an apartment. You know, that's great and wonderful, praise God, okay, on how we get our things. But that's the resource God is reminding us tonight through this lesson that God is the source of our blessing. And if Peter's gonna be all that God wants him to be, Peter's got to act in obedience because obedience yields God's blessing in one way or another all the time. And so, Peter, you go down and you go look for this fish. Now, this is an astonishing principle here because now, okay, I got to trust God's ways. Now, you're going to go get the first fish. And so what this means is, is somewhere in the big sea of Galilee, somebody dropped a coin and little Nemo came by and scooped it up in his mouth and Jesus knew exactly, Nemo just kept swimming, he knew exactly where that fish was gonna be. Had Peter had gave any pushback to Jesus, I don't wanna do it that way. Let's do this later. Let's use a net. Had Peter said any of those things, he would have missed this fish. And it's a reminder, don't argue with God because you don't want to miss his blessing that's already in root. It's not for us to know the why. Had the fish. It's not for us to know that. He didn't say, Peter, well, um, at two knots so go, uh, the fish picked up a coin. He didn't say that. He just told them what to do. Peter listened, and God blessed. I think God wants to do that in my life and in your life. We just need to be willing to be obedient. I heard this story about um, this couple, young couple, didn't have a, a nickel to their name, literally, felt God's call to go to Honduras and be missionaries in a remote part, dangerous part at the time. It cost $5,000 to go on this trip. They wanted to go there to explore it to see if this is where they're going to set up their mission. A man in their church heard about this. He was a fisherman. He was entering a contest and the top prize um, was $20,000, um, and there were other prizes. And he said to them that if I win a prize, any prize, I'm going to contribute towards your trip. God overheard that conversation, and he caught first prize, and he underwrote their entire trip and continued to sow into their ministry. They went there, they set up shop, and they've been there ever since. Look how that chain of events worked out for the glory of God. That's just the mindset that we need to have. And you know, when you think about this fish, I mean, it's carrying something pretty important. You know, fish can be worth a lot of money. Um, you know, you could study this, but there are some in, you know, incredible fish that, it, you know, some of you aren't fishermen, but it, you might want to be a fisherman after you hear this. Uh, the platinum aurora fish, if you caught that, that's worth $400,000, by the way. Some of you are going, you know, looking to get a fishing pole right now tonight, right? Um, there's the flower corn chinchow fish, $600,000 if you caught it. And a lot has to do with their color. They're not so much that people want to eat them, but to capture them, they, they have an incredible color. Um, but there, there's also the cornea fish, which is worth $1.8 million. Remarkable. And then, of course, there's the blue fin, which makes for great sushi. Um, I think on record, there's a guy who paid uh, several years ago, paid $2.1 million for a blue fin fish. Uh, pretty incredible if you think about it. But what we're reading here tonight far exceeds a dollar value. There's a spiritual value on top of this, this solution of provision, if you will. He says, when you open its mouth, you're going to find a coin. Take it and give it to them. Now finish it with me. For me and for you. Don't miss the last part. I think Jesus is illustrating something else. He is telling Peter that I am the only one, the way that he did this with the fish, I'm the only one who could cover your debt. I don't think he's talking about money now. I think this is a foreshadowing of the cross if you think about it. He's showing Peter that you have a debt to pay, that mankind has a debt to pay, and I'm the only one who could provide for it in a miraculous way. 
And I think that frustrates people. That's why you don't see people attacking other religions because they're not a threat to evil. Only Christianity is. Only Christ is a threat to keep hell's population down. That's why. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through him. And so this coin, it's for the temple, but if you think about it, he's the temple. The temple's where they, the temple was kind of that, you know, if you will, that middle ground between the believer and God. Now Jesus has come, God has come in human flesh. He is the one true mediator between man and God. He is the temple. And so Peter pay it, but a greater payment's going to be made for the temple. And Peter, it's been covered. And I leave you with that thought tonight. If you could trust God for the forgiveness of sins. Listen, he took Barabbas' place, right? Literally. But he also took my place and your place on the cross, if you think about it. We'll wait for the noise pollution to pass, okay? Okay. Is that necessary, right? What a waste of money too, right? You could do a lot of good with that money. Think about that. If you could trust God to provide for the forgiveness of sins and for eternal life, you could trust him for whatever of a need you have right now or might have tomorrow or down the road because God is faithful and salvation is found in no other name but the name of Jesus Christ. It's not found in religion. It's not found in you and I writing a check and that get none of those things. It's found exclusively in Jesus Christ. He's reminding Peter of that because Peter's going to need this because we know what's going to happen to Peter later on. A little girl's kind of going to scare him. He's going to deny Christ three times. Like Judas, I think he was getting ready to take his life. But what was his saving grace is almighty God. Jesus said, I pray for you, Peter, that your faith wouldn't fail. And right here, he's doing that. He's building Peter up because Peter's going to have those moments like you and I when we do deny Christ, when we don't believe, when our faith is weak. And Jesus is building him up so that Peter's going to get to a place that he's going to think like a child of God. Obviously, he's going to take the high road because that's what Jesus does, have the same attitude of Christ. But most importantly, he's going to trust thy ways over his ways. And if you and I are going to be truly people of faith and believe in this solution of provision and trust that God is faithful to provide, and like Peter, we need to believe this way as well. God is faithful. God is faithful today. He's going to be faithful if he gives us tomorrow. All of his promises find their yes and their amen in Jesus. You could trust Jesus. Put your tackle box down. He's got the answers. He is faithful. Paul said it this way to the church at Philippi, that our God shall supply for all of our needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus in glory. Don't forget that. And so as we close, I close with a kind of a a fish version of Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own tackle box, okay, in your own nets. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, be in agreement with him. And he will not only direct your paths, but he'll provide while you're on those paths. The solution of provision found in the sea that God created, literally a fish at just the right time. God created that fish. He purposed that fish to come there at that moment. Peter, in obedience, dropped his hook, and the blessing was found. What blessings does God have come in your way that we need to think like a child of God, take the high road, and trust God for it? God has greater things to do in my life and your life like he did Peter. One of the most important lessons and applications of the Scripture is believing and trusting that God is faithful to provide. And so may God meet the needs that you have today and each day that he gives to us. May we be people who constantly point to Christ, not us as the one who provides. And until the Lord calls us home, we'll be building up lots and lots of reasons to give praise to God 
because he is faithful. Jesus Christ is faithful. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. If you believe that, say amen.